Who's got another homework question? Anybody else? I'm going to make a change. I think the best way to talk about this is just to do it. So I'm going to take this original equation right here, right here, and I'm going to make one change. Do you remember how we started off with a circle and then I made a change? I made the coefficients different. By the way, let me just go back. This is what we started with. That was what we started with right there. Okay, remember how that was different from a circle? Oh, well, the coefficients are different right here, 16 and 9. They're, they're not the same thing, okay? Which means when I divide by 144, I get different things. Okay, I'm going to make one more change. Watch me. I'm making a subtraction problem. What? What does that do? It turns the it turns the ellipse inside out. It turns the ellipse inside out. Yeah. It turns the ellipse inside out. Hmm. Well, let me clean some of this stuff up. I don't need that. Um, I don't need... I don't need any of that. There was our regular ellipse, right? Remember this? Instead of... Here, let me clean some of this stuff up too. Get rid of the focus. Remember, the definition of an ellipse from geometry says that if you pick any point on the ellipse, like this point right here, that the distance from one focus, whoosh, oh, that's terrible. My hand really warbled on that one. Oh, my goodness, I'm on a race. Why is my life so hard? I'm just kidding. I have a pretty good life. The distance this plus the distance to this one, D2, was equal to a constant, right? Remember this one? Remember, for an ellipse, distance 1 plus distance 2 has to be fixed. But what did I just do? What did I just do? It's not distance 1 plus distance 2. What, what, what would it be? It's minus. It's minus. Which means that for a hyperbola, it's going to be subtraction, and it really has to be then the absolute values of those things because you can't have a negative number. What does it mean when the distances between this and that are fixed? What it's going to do is it's going to break apart this connection here. Um, it's, this, this is curled in on itself this way, right? You see that this side comes down. Here, I'll do it in red. This side comes down and meets this side from the other one. It's, they're curled together. They're curled together. What does a what does a hyperbola do? A hyperbola pulls them away. And so the blue curve there does something like this. This is the, just a sketch. The blue curve there, instead of curling in on itself, it curls out on itself like that. Okay, the new stuff there, that's a hyperbola. It curls out on itself. Does that make sense? Do you understand the idea? It's not a parabola. It's not a parabola. It is an inside-out ellipse. Parabola is actually harder, believe it or not. 
What does this mean now in terms of a point? Here, let me clean this up a little bit just so it looks symmetric. Okay, so what we'll have now is this blue stuff here, and I won't have any of this. Won't have any of that. Um, so then what does this mean? What it means is my foci are not my foci are not inside anymore. See the foci were here and here, which was inside the curvature of the ellipse. My foci now are outside, which means they're gonna be someplace with inside this little cup surface and sometimes somehow inside this little cup surface. And so what this means is I can take any point now on the hyperbola and the distance from one focus to the other focus, way, you got to reach way across there, D2. That's now, the difference is now fixed. Do you understand the idea? the concept. Okay. Let me show you the technical things of how to how to construct it, okay? So I'm going to take this here and I'm going to move it across and I'm going to do it again over here. So this is now going to be 16x squared minus 9y squared plus 4. So analytically now 16x squared minus 9y squared is equal to 144. You need to divide by 144 again, so divide both sides by 144. Don't put your pencils down, just watch. If you're taking notes, the answer is no. Okay, this is going to be then x squared divided by, what did we say it was, 9, 3 squared? Minus, though, that's your key thing. When one of the values is squared and the other one is squared, but one is positive and one is negative, that's a hyperbola. It could be y squared minus x squared. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one of them is, is minus and the other one isn't. This then was, what, 4 squared is equal to 1? Okay, how do I graph that? Um, my center is still 0, 0. So um, let me draw my coordinate axes. X and Y. My center is still 0, 0. Okay. Now, do you see that X under, underneath here has a 3 as a root of that? Okay. Go up 1, 2, 3. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not up. Go right 1, 2, 3. Go left 1, 2, 3. Okay. Do you see that the y squared has underneath it a 4 squared? Go up, 1, 2, 3, 4. Go down, 1, 2, 3, 4. And, but now instead of the, this being the vertex of the curl, this becomes a box. Just be patient. Follow what I'm doing. I make a box out of this. This is three units. This is four units. Do you see how I made a box? Okay, good. Now, watch what I'm going to do here in green. I'm going to do the diagonal of this box. And I got to be it nice and precise. Okay, so it's going to go from that corner to that corner. And that corner to that corner, and there we go. And then this one, this corner to this corner. And then this corner up to that corner. These are asymptotes. What do you mean? They're just boundary lines. It's not part of the graph. It's just bound it's just boundary lines. Okay. Now you have to come back in here and you have to see which one's positive. Which one's positive? The x is the positive one. 
Okay, it's the Y is the negative one. What does that mean? It's a hyperbola that's going to open sideways like this. You're going to get two different ones. It looks like a, a parabola with a mirror image on the other side. Okay, but it's going to open sideways. Why is that? Because the X value is positive, the Y value is negative. It's going to open sideways. Okay? Which means you're going to have a graph in this area or here, and you're not going to have anything top and bottom. Your top and bottom are going to be empty. Now, remember that when we did an ellipse, it touched on these points here as it went around. Right? Remember the ellipse touched here? The vertices here, they touched. Okay? But they're going to touch here. But they're only going to touch on the side that's the positive. It's going to touch right there and touch right there. And what it's going to do is it's going to open up and come along that line. It's going to approach that boundary line there in green but not touch it. And this side is going to come up and approach it. Oh, it doesn't touch like that. The red part now, this and this, that's the graph of the hyperbola. There's nothing up here in this or this. Only here and here. These green lines are not part of the graph. They are asymptotes. Have we talked about asymptotes yet? No? No. All right. Good. Okay. So an asymptote here, let me make sure that you spell it correctly. Asympote. Asympotote. Not really. Asymptote. This is an asymptote. This is a boundary line. Um, for the ends of the graph. Some people used to say like asymptotes are just boundary lines for the graph and that they don't cross. No, you can have something that crosses in the middle, but not at the ends. It's a boundary line for the extreme ends. So it gets closer and closer and closer. This graph now gets closer and closer and closer and closer to this green line, but never touches it. It's like a fence. It's a boundary line. Okay, now you only have two vertices. You've got a vertex where it uh, the graph touches the box on the X side over here. So this vertex is gonna be then, oh, hang on, I can't write it there. This vertex right here is gonna be then negative three, zero. And over here is gonna be positive three, zero. That's your vertex. The ends of the hyperbola is run right by the uh, asymptotes, yes. It's a fence. So it, like it, it approaches the fence and goes right along the fence. Closer, always closer and closer and closer, but never touching. It's the idea of a limit. I can't, I can't not say the word limit. Like I'm not supposed to. Like I've, I've sworn an oath not to divulge the secrets of calculus for those whose minds are not ready to receive them. It's like there was a ceremony with candles and everything. Um, but this isn't. I don't think this is one of them. I don't think it's one of them limit. There's a limit to how far the red line can go. The green line is the limit. Faith says you hope there wasn't. Hope there wasn't what? Candles? Oh yeah, there was an entire ceremony. Oh yeah. Like there was, there was ID cards and everything involved. Really weird. No, it wasn't really weird. It was good. It was, it was the, <clears throat> the Mr. Marsh Calculus Society. <laughs> no. Oh, I was officiating, right? I was officiating. Mr. Marsh Calculus. There are some secrets in calculus that you shouldn't give to people too soon. They have to. They have to earn it. So it was. It was the Calculus Secret Society. Like I made membership cards for everybody. Had them laminated. <laughs> like we blacked out the door and like had you know had a, had a candle ceremony and had food and so forth. It was. It was kind of fun. 
Yep. And then they were forbidden to exp to tell underclassmen like what the secrets of calculus were. Like people always thought, like, oh, it's like it's hard. Well, it is to a point. And then like, oh, I can't tell you. Like, I can't tell you the, the secrets of calc. Nope, <clears throat> can't tell you that. Okay. So now, where are the foci? Oh, ho, ho, ho. There's there's foci here. Um, let's do this. The focus for a hyperbola is this. This time it's going to be c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. So this is now c squared is equal to um, what? Nine plus sixteen. Twenty-five. So that means c is equal to five. The foci still sit along this major kind of axis that comes through here. But now it's five units out. One, two, three, four, five. Your foci sit here. This is your focus. One, two, three, four, five. Focus sits right here. That's your, there's your focus. The, the focus has to be inside the curl. Inside the curl. Now, um, something to, to say about hyperbolas. Uh, let me do the equation of a hyperbola over here. It's going to be x minus h squared minus y minus k squared is equal to 1. This is now always the a squared, b squared. Um, you can't change these around now. Like you can't call one of them a and one of them b or something like that. This always, it's fixed. Um that maybe doesn't mean a whole lot to you right now because you don't know what it else it looks like. Okay, but the center is going to be an h and k. You could have an alternate one that says this. You could have one that says y minus k squared over a squared minus x minus h squared over b squared is equal to 1. And then this would be one that opens up and down like that. Okay. All right. Um, I haven't even looked at the book. There's some vocabulary on page 445. You should read it and learn it. Um, hyperbola, focal radii. That's the distance from one focus to another one, or one from a point on the graph to a focus. Then you've got branches, vertices, transverse axis, conjugate axis. That's the, the short box, um, or the box that doesn't have the thing. Um, center, la da 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 are you for real? I can't, I can't take it. I can't, I can't, I can't take it at all. Like I'm shocked. Look at example number one in the book. You got your book with you? I didn't invert anything. I just pulled somebody else's question. Somebody asked me to do number three. That's all I did, right? That's where this came from. Somebody asked me to do question number three out of the textbook from the previous section, okay? I, I pulled that one. Okay, and then as we went through this one, well, it was plus, right? Because it, it, it was an ellipse. Well, you're trying to get things that are perfect squares. And so 144 and 9 and 16 are all perfect squares that do go together. They're, it's like a... Mm. Mm. Something. <laughs> mm. And I just thought that's a good thing to just jump right off on because we did it as an ellipse. And so I'm just thinking this is this makes a good starting off point for the lesson. So like here we go. I'm just I'm gonna do the lesson based on that. So I just took the opportunity that you presented me, whoever it was that asked for number three. That was a that was poetic. That was kind of rhyming. Um, I just took whatever question I had been presenting with and said I can just merge it right into the lesson for today, 
And now I look back in the book and they've done nearly exactly the same thing. Okay, so um, you can look at example number two. Example number two is simple. Um, I'm going to jump ahead now and let's talk about something. Let's do... Let's do number... Nope, don't want to do that one. Let's do... I'm trying to get one. I don't want to do an odd one because you're assigned to the odd ones. Hmm. I, I want, let me do number 12, but I'm going to change the order. Can I, um, let me change the order. So this is similar to number 12. Okay, are you tracking with me? I'm going to do something similar to number 12, but I'm going to say why, why, I don't want blue. y plus 5 squared over 1 minus, because that's going to change things now. It's very important when you do order when you subtract. x minus 2 squared over, what is it, 9 equals 1. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so copy that down, and when you're done copying, tell me done. What time are we out of here? I'm having too much fun. I lost, totally lost track of time. 2.30. Okay, so we got half an hour. Good. We're, we're, we're doing good. <laughs> like if I didn't have a schedule of stopping time, like sometimes this stuff would go like hours and hours and hours. And I'd be like, wait, what, like, what day is it? Like I got so involved in what was going on here. What's going on? Okay, good. Now, put your pencil down. I'm going to start building the graph. I'm going to start again building the graph. There we go. It has to recognize X and Y. Um, can you tell me my center? Oh, nice. Oh, well, be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. The y value has to come first because it's the y value minus the x value. But this is still your y value of the center, and this is still your x value of the center. They, they go with each other. The center is not 5 uh, or negative 5, 2. Okay? You've got to manage now which parts are which. It's not just the first thing is X and the second thing is Y. These are in opposite order now. So your mind's got to spot that, all right? Good. No, 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 good. That's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it. That's why I made you put your pencil down and watch because you can't be copying down and following intellectually what's going on. There's a collision in your mind. So the center now is equal to 2, negative 5. Where's that? 2, negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right here. This is the center now. This is the center of the hyperbola. So I'm going to make a little point right there. 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right there. Now, the center of the hyperbola is not a solution point. Okay, so it's not a graph. All right? Now, what I have to do is I have to find the denominator roots. This is going to be 1 squared. This is going to be 3 squared. Agreed? Okay. This is the little, um, there, it's not a radii anymore. It's not, a, it's not an X radius and a Y radius. It's the extensions from the center to your box. But look, do you see that 1 goes with Y and 3 goes with X? Okay, so I'm going to build my box now with 1s along the Ys and 3s along the Xs. So my box is going to be up one unit, stop, down one unit, stop. And my X's are now right three units, one, two, three, stop, and left, one, two, three, stop. And so here is my little 
I'm not even going to use solid lines. Here is my little asymptote rectangle. Okay. Catch up. If you must, they're dotted lines. I draw them as dotted lines because it's not actually a solution point. It's not part of the graph. It's just the structure. And the book is using dotted lines too. That's a good idea, book. Mr. Book, we finally agree. Even though Elizabeth found a boo boo in you. And the book's going to say, Marsh, like how many errors have you made through the course of the school year so far in this class versus how many errors have I made? And I'm going to be like, dang it. But a book's written by how many people? And all of them, all of them are better mathematicians than me. Stanley Smith, Randall Charles, D John Dossie, Marvin Bittinger, content consultants, Elizabeth Cunningham, Sean Jackson, Sandra Mosteller, Bridget Haley, reviewers, Donald Price, Joyce Henderson. It's a committee. People check each other's math work. <sighs> Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. Are you ketchup or mustard? <laughs> Have you caught up yet? Ketchup. Okay. No, not mayo. Don't get me started on that. I went to Culver's over the weekend, and they messed up my order. Drove all the way home, opened up the burger, and it was like they had mayo on my burger. I was mad. I literally got in my car and drove back up like another five, ten minutes back to Culver's and like, look, <laughs> fix this. Do not like mayonnaise on burgers. Well, that's not part of the conversation. You're caught up by now, which means that we have asymptotes. Okay, so I'm going to draw a diagonal. You draw a diagonal on yours. It's got to be a diagonal. Oh, I'm, the automatic line thing is not working now. Come on. Automatic line. There you go. It's got to go right through the corners. Be very precise. Right through the corners. There we go. Something like that. What did I miss? Relish. You will relish the moment when you catch up. <laughs> I love this class. <laughs> All right, you got your asymptotes. Yes? Come on. Yes, yes. Okay, good. All right. So, which way does it open? It's either going to open up and down, or it'll open left and right. The blue actually being the graph part. Which is it? Whichever one's positive. It's going to open up and down. Okay, good. So what does that mean? It means the top of the box now is a vertex, and the bottom of the box now is a vertex. And um, so it's going to be like a really kind of a shallow. This one's like ridiculously shallow. A small, shallow kind of a parabola here. Something like that. Maybe I can draw the down one a little bit better. It's, it's like ordinarily I would maybe turn my paper sideways or something like that. It's going to come closer and closer and closer to the asymptotes. But never touch. It's like, you know, the princess bride. Inhale deeply, but do not touch. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is called iocane powder. Okay, so the... The blue part is actually the graph. And like, you know, if you wanted to, 
you could even remove the asymptotes to help you see it. Like there's the graph right there. It's kind of ugly compared to the other graphs I've been doing. Okay, but there's your there's your hyperbola. Okay, the center is at two negative five. Oops, sorry, I didn't put parentheses around those. Shame on me. Okay, now where are your foci? Foci are a c distance away, and c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared, and so c squared is equal to 10, and so c is equal to positive and negative square root of 10. What is that? That's like 3.2 or something like that. So the foci then are going to be measured from the center up 1, 2, 3.2. There's a focus right here. And then down uh, one, two, three. There's a there's like a focus right there. So what are these points now? All right. So let's talk talk about the vertices. The vertices, the points are going to be this location right here. What is what's the coordinates of that point? It's going to be right two down one, two, three, four. So two negative four. That's a vertex. And then your other vertex down here is also going to be two. And then 5, 6, negative 6. Okay, your foci then are going to be along this same axis now, which gives you an x value of 2. But now it's going to be negative 4 plus root 10. Leave it as an exact value, right? It's going to be down 4, but then plus root 10. Do you see how I go back up to find that location? Down 4, but plus root 10, because the distance from the center to the focus is root 10. Okay, and so the other focus is going to be then um, the coordinates 2, negative 6, minus root 10. That'll be your coordinates for the foci. And you don't have to erase your asymptotes, but I would make it clear that your asymptotes are very light, maybe like light pencil marks or even light dashed lines, because you really want to focus on the graph itself, which are the blue parts. Um, the textbook can publish something that looks, you know, somewhat similar, just like that. And they can do stuff with color. So, yep. Any questions so far? So a hyperbola is a ellipse turned inside out. What it is, is the collection of all points such that the distance from one focus a D1 compared to another focus, D2, D1 minus D2, the absolute value of that, because it might be negative, is equal to a fixed constant. And so the, um, the, the Greeks, classical Greeks, knew about this shape. Um, and an ellipse and some stuff like that. But it was it was really technical. This thing that we're doing now with uh, the equation and running running this, you know, to find the focus points and stuff like that, and then doing this kind of a work over here to find your A and your B and so forth. That's all Rene Descartes. And so what Rene Descartes did is Rene Descartes took geometry and algebra and merge them together and very quickly once he got these two systems to have like a common um, symbolic system once he was able to describe points and lines and curves in space he can do it algebraically with an x and a y like in, in a matter of several weeks like less than two months i think it was like five weeks or something like that if i remember right he was able to give definitive proofs for things that 
geometers, people who studied geometry, clear back to the classical Greeks, couldn't prove. What do you think about that? It was funny because this actually came up today in, um, in geometry. We're doing some stuff in geometry and, and it involves some circles and some lines and there was a couple theorems and stuff like that and the book said that um, a proof for these theorems will be saved until chapter 13. And one of the students was saying like, well, why is that? Like, how come you're delaying the proof for this? And it was because I, I think, I have to go back and study it, but if I remember right, it was one of the things that Descartes proved using algebra. But in geometry up until this point, we haven't done anything with, with a Cartesian coordinate grid. It's just been, oh, look, I'm, I shouldn't have. I, should, I knew I when, I, when I crumpled it up, I knew I should have saved it. Oh, that's terrible. Huh. I've got, mm. We're doing this kind of stuff on non-lined paper, right? Non-lined paper, just blank paper. We're doing compass and, and so forth and doing some circle things over here like this, like blank paper, no lines, right? You've got to make your own lines. <laughs> That's geometry, some simple, simple, simple geometry. Descartes, right? Also Spinoza, but Descartes. Here's, here's the stuff we were doing today in geometry, okay? By the way, this one right here, this one right here is um, division. He's dividing something using geometry, not algebra, or not even arithmetic. Division using geometry, using shapes. This one right here involves the square root. Like, this is amazing. This, this construction right here, and we did this in class today, this construction right here takes the square root of a number by hand. And I'm going to read you, hang on. I'm going to read you this section right here. No, before we do that. Um, <clears throat> he said, if we wish to solve any problem, I'm reading you right out of the car. If we wish to solve any problem, he means ge geometry problem. Because this is this is his book, Geometry. Geometry. Whoops, what is Geometry. This is his book on doing algebra on geometry. So he says it should be noted. No. If then we wish to solve any problem, we first suppose the solution already affected. You you assume the solution does exist. And give names to all the lines that seem needful for its construction, to those that are unknown as well as to those that are known. Then Making no distinction between known and unknown lines, we must unravel the difficulty in any way that shows most naturally the relations between those lines. But here's what he says. We must first find as many such equations as there are supposed to be unknown lines. That's a key thing in algebra. If you have four unknown things, you need four separate equations. Do you remember doing a system of two equations earlier in this chapter, in, in this book? You had an X and a Y. Didn't you have to have two equations to solve for an x variable simultaneously with a y variable? Yes. Remember when we had like wasn't it was it was an algebra two that we had three right? Didn't we have x, y, and z? How many equations did you need? Three, three unknowns, three equations, straight out of Descartes. We must find as many such equations as there are supposed to be unknown lines. And then he says like you you work them down. Here he is doing his. His algebra, here's his system of equations, doing it for geometry, which was unusual. And he's trying, he's, he's using this diagram now to do some kind of a problem, and he just gets the student started. He just gets you started. And here's what he says. This is so good. I love this. He says, but I shall not stop to explain this in more detail because I should deprive you of the pleasure of mastering it yourself as well as the advantage of training your mind by working over it, which is, in my opinion, the principal benefit to be derived from this science. Do you understand what he says? He's, he's teaching. This is his textbook. He says, I'm not going to finish the solution for you, because if I did, 
I would rob you of the opportunity of discovering it yourself. I would rob you of the joy of figuring it out yourself. Okay? And also the strength that your mind would get in doing the solution. I'm going to read it to you again. I shall not stop to explain this in more detail because I should deprive you of the pleasure of mastering it yourself as well as of the advantage of training your mind by working over it, which is, in my opinion, the principal benefit to be derived from this science. I think good teachers, in the end, don't tell their students all the answers. A good math teacher should not finish every single solution for the student or spoon feed the students every single thing. Descartes says you get, you get enjoyment and satisfaction out of doing it yourself that, you're, that, that is taken from you if somebody else does it for you. Have you ever been in the class and the teacher called on you and you had the answer, but, but you, it took a second or two for you to think about it and some other smarty pants in the, in, the, in the classroom blurted it out? You ever have that happen to you? Like you, you had it, you had it. Don't you feel robbed? stole my answer like I was there was a joy in giving the right answer that like Bobby took it from me hmm. he also says there's an advantage of training your mind like when am I ever gonna use this in my job who cares you're getting mentally stronger and you will use that strength all over the place he says I find nothing here so difficult that it cannot be worked out by anyone at all familiar with ordinary geometry and with algebra who will consider carefully all that is set forth in this treatise. If it can be solved by any ordinary geometry, it can be then applied to algebra. So he says here, these same problems can be found by many other methods, his solution here. I have given these very simple ones, and that, like I looked at them like I don't think they're simple, but anyway. He says, I've given these very simple ones to show that it is possible to construct all the problems of ordinary geometry by doing no more than the little covered in the four figures that I explained. He takes four geometric situations. He applies algebra principles to those, and he says, you can do all of geometry using the techniques from one or more of those four simple algebra things that I did. This is the one thing I believe the ancient mathematicians did not observe, for otherwise they would not have put so much labor into writing so many books in which the very sequence of the proposition shows that they did not have a sure method of finding it all, but rather gathered together those propositions on which they had happened by accident. He says, um, the ancient writers were forced to use words to explain geometry. He's using algebraic symbols. Right, He says, here I beg you to observe in passing that the considerations that forced ancient writers to use arithmetical terms in geometry, thus making it impossible for them to proceed beyond the point where they could see clearly the relation between two subjects, caused much obscurity and embarrassment in their attempts at explanations. He says the algebra gives us very simple symbols to describe to geometric properties. And so instead of trying to use words to explain things in a Socratic logic statement, we can use an algebra statement with symbols and simple mathematical operators, and we can, we can arrive quickly at conclusions that took them awkward, long, drawn-out passages to say in words. So good. I'm sorry, what time is it? Like, are you over time yet? Oh, no, I guess I still got 15 more minutes. Okay. I'm sorry, you you got me on a tangent. I got myself on a tangent. Why was the math book said? No. See, like I decided years ago, I'm stop I'm not calling them problems anymore. Have you noticed that? That's, court you bring you got a nice joke. Okay, I'm gonna speak to that now. I don't call them problems. Problems are when you got a flat tire on your way to work. That's a problem. Have you noticed? I don't call them problems. What do I call them? I've changed the language that I use to talk about mathematics. I don't, I have, if I have ever called it a problem, it was an accident, and I hopefully quickly corrected myself. They're questions. Yes, thank you. 
their questions. I think we do mathematics students a disservice by always calling them problems. Now, granted, a problem in mathematics doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as it does in like common speech, but the emotional sense is there. You tracking with me? I can call them questions. Why? Questions have answers. It's a mathematical question. Hmm. Can we find the answer? And sometimes the answer is no solution. But don't you realize that's an answer? Yeah, no, I call them questions. So not my, my math books are not sad at all. My math books are full of questions, good questions, except for the one Elizabeth found. <laughs> that was a bad question. Uh, I guess questions can be bad. <laughs> oh, why did the two four skip lunch? They already ate. Oh yeah, why was seven afraid of uh, eight? Because seven, eight, nine, or there's something like that. There. Hmm. Oh, did I tell you my King Arthur joke? I might not have done that in this class. King Arthur joke? No. Why was the math book confused? I had a lot of questions. But afterwards, after it did the work, it had a lot of answers. All right. Since we're talking about circles, I'll do my I'll do my King Arthur joke. Um, Y'all know about a circle, right? Okay. It's got a radius. Okay. So, um, who... Who was the fattest knight at King Arthur's round table? Like, I can't believe I haven't told you this joke yet. Like, you're going to tell me, oh, I've heard that one already. Who was the fattest knight at King Arthur's round table? Nobody? Yeah, circumference. Circumference. Oh, court, I'm not done yet. Stop, stop interfering. Okay. How fat was he? Oh, I actually made the second part up. Like, I kid you not. How fat was he? He was as fat as two pies are. It gives you the formula for the circumference. What does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it sounds poetic, though. How fat was he? He was as fat as two pies are. Like, what kind of pies? Probably pumpkin, because that's what I would be eating if I was a fat knight at the at the round table. Um, yeah. You'll never forget that formula again. Of course you won't, because sooner or later you'll figure out that area is equal to pi r squared, and there's a connection between this and that. But I've promised not to divulge the secrets of calculus to those whose minds are not yet ready to receive them. Wait, what just happened? I'm not telling, but I guess it's on video, so you can go back and watch it if you want to. All right. Um, like, that That was that was the lesson for today. Uh how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? I don't know, Elizabeth. Is this a math joke? Twice as much as half. There you go. 